And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have not one but two newcomers into the temple, creators of the upcoming, the upcoming Viking RPG Rune and Steel, one of one of whom the the author of Fury of the Northmen, the other a Hema a longtime Hema practitioner, the one and only's Ryan and Kale Shuck. Hopefully, I got the last name pronounced right. Well done. Fought on. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would just like to uh, mention that you just invited the creators of a Viking game into a monastery. Yeah, this seems like a, this could go terribly wrong. This is a monastery that wel that welcomes all, that welcomes all creeds, as long as you obey the rules. Is uh, plundering in the rules? We plunder the other guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then just point us in that direction. Yeah. Um, now, when, now, with the, with that said, with all that said, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So walk me through your first, your respective first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick for you? Uh, well, I'll start since I'm the oldest, if that's all right, Kale. Yeah, go ahead. So I was about... 14 and that's been a long long time ago let me put it that way and uh my mother actually bought me a it was actually an iron crown enterprises uh it was called gorgoroth and it was for middle earth role playing mm -hmm. and uh that got me in she thought she was buying me dungeons and dragons stuff you know whatever and i love luckily it was my, my favorite books were uh tolkien's lord of the rings so i really didn't care so i ended up actually starting out um with ICE and that would be the late 80s and uh then I had a buddies that played first and second edition Dungeons and Dragons and uh I don't know I, I was always you know reading those choose your own adventures that were actually wizards warriors and you if you know what that is it was actually a uh, choose your own adventures with uh with wizardry so I thought that was way cooler than the actual choose your own adventures mm -hmm. but uh anyway we uh I had a friend named Jason Rader and uh, we go to his house and he had all the cool posters everywhere and you know we played first edition and then uh, yeah I just I fell in love with the the genre and just the game the that kind of game uh, I enjoyed you know all aspects of it obviously when you're younger the uh, hack and slash combat of first edition was pretty cool but uh, my first love was actually role master mm -hmm. uh, I, I liked the rules better they were a little weighty you kind of had to skip some of them you had to you had to kind of pick and choose what you used in that system, and obviously, uh, you know, we changed a lot of things. But uh, that was uh, the game system, and then uh, first and second edition. So I'll let Kale yeah. go. It's fu it's funny that it's it's funny for a couple of reasons that you bring up um, Rollmaster, because well, for one, that thing started out as a D and D hack that just got out of control, and two, um, and I've covered. The Rollmaster is a is an interesting affair, and I and I want I want to get a t I want to get a t shirt made that just says "Make Criticals Hurt Again." Well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> um. Well, that's that's one half of the origin story. Yeah. So uh, to continue that, I guess my dad thought it pertinent to continue that cycle. So I also started when I was about 13, 14. Uh, he GM'd our first session. So it was me and my brother and my next door neighbor. And we played, um, I want to say it's the Crucible of Frey, a D and d adventure. Um, we, I mean, I guess I, the reason I got hooked on it, because I'm, I'll be honest, originally my thoughts were, well, this is going to be a, a little bit nerdy and I don't know how much fun this is going to be. But when you get into it, I was like, oh, this is like the ultimate sandbox, which is probably to the GM's dismay. Mm -hmm. And give, now, given the, given the fact that you mentioned that module, which um, I'm, trying to th I'm trying to think what edition that might have been. I'm, I, keep thinking, I keep thinking advanced second, but... It was, three, it was three or three five. 
yeah, it, I think it was three five. It it might be my um, if if I were to dig through my if I were to dig through my third edition books, it would be like it would be like going to the Library of Congress. <laughs> so, I'm sure I'm sure it, I'm sure it was. I'm just I'm just I'm not motivated enough to dig to dig through my library to figure out if it was or not. <laughs> but given given that name of course and given the fact that you get that rune and steel is a very viking um game one qu one question that i have is what did you guys always have a long standing interest in norse mythology and culture uh, i did from when i was very young and i don't it's just always been there with me and i really couldn't tell you exactly where it started i think it was somewhere oddly whenever i was looking up the name for a character and uh you know as a player back when i was a kid and uh the name skuld s-k-u-l-d uh or skull deer was mm -hmm. one that i chose and i don't know that was just the beginning and then i just read everything i could about it and uh we've I think between us, we've read most of the, I think, uh, most of the popular sagas, if not all. I know that I missed a few. I spoke to, a, I spoke to another guy named Ludo, who's actually more of a historian. The other day, and I, I he mentioned a few, but they actually didn't get put out till like the 16th century. So as far as the old ones, I think we've read most of the sagas. Yeah. And well, I would like to clarify by red there, we mean the English translations. We are not proficient in Old Norse yet, at least. No. Correct. And although um although I'm per I get the feeling you guys wouldn't you guys would enjoy the work of um Ian Stewart Sharp in that regard. Um I what does he do? Um he's his big claim to fame is a is a series of books he's worked on called the Viking Verse, which is kind of this alternate history approach to Viking history, as asking the question, "What if they actually drove back the Chris, the uh, Christians?" Um, oh, that, that actually does sound pretty fascinating. He he recently put out a bit more of a tongue in cheek book called Old Norse for Modern Times. That's basically taking. A lot of common phrases or pop culture phrases, and how they'd be translate translated into Old Norse, with some creative liberties, and in, in a few cases, obviously. I found him. Yes, he, that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Got the All Father paradox, Loki's wager. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean. I've I've always been a big fan of like the Last Kingdom books and things like that, so mm -hmm. I would imagine he would be right in that genre. I have also read uh, I think almost all of the Bernard Cornwell's books. Yeah. Now, even though, even though Rune, now Rune and Steel, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, is set is set in the continent of Norther. Um. But taking that taking that into account, would it be fair of me to assume that you that it is it has the it has the major theming of a Viking story, but it isn't necessarily trying to be set in a in a historical part of Scandinavia. Okay, I'll yeah, let you take that. Absolutely. So we decided that it was best not to trample on actual history because we wanted to do a lot of, uh, I would say, have a lot of creative license over the sagas and events. And so when we uh, created Norther, we didn't want to, uh, I guess, misinform people or misconstrue history. So we went through and made sure that we had a lot of Norse themes mm -hmm. and actually the major underlying theme of the world and the major conflict is set about 20 years before the viking age is when it began so and then it runs into it but uh from a historical basis right we didn't want to mess that up mm -hmm. and to to kind of go into that so we have several cultures built into the game and they do have I mean, I would say most of them have a pretty strong basis in historical cultures. Uh, we, you know, we didn't stray too far from that. But then, of course, because they were sagas, we also threw in, you know, the Norse mythology uh, races like 
dwarves, light elves, dark elves, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, those are with, you know, we put in a giant warning. These are not balanced. Uh, We recommend playing the human cultures and sticking with that. And yeah, to add on to that, our human cultures are all again historically based, and we, uh, the realm of Norther has some license, which is why we use it instead of actual historical Scandinavia. But I think a lot of people who are uh, more historically interested will find a lot that they're uh, can relate to or find his- historical uh, Easter eggs nuggets that would be pretty historically accurate. Oh, all right. And now, with now, um, given the fact that it's, it that it's described as having a system that's me, that's meant to that's meant to be um easy to play but hard but hard to master at its core. And this is a question that I've, that I've asked um the previous um previous guest um the guy behind Meteor Tales. A lot of RPG systems will have a all roads lead to Rome when it comes to it when it comes to its die resolution, or non or non or resolution method if you if it's using something that isn't die. W- given the fact that you guys have mentioned um, Rollmaster as an inspiration, is is it fair to assume that you guys are using a D one hundred based system, or do you have something else in mind? Uh, we did so. We did not use Rollmaster's percentile system. Uh, it's too here. Here's what we did do. I'll, I'll tell you this. I find that D twenty and D one hundreds there are too variable in your day to day skill. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a real base example. Let's just talk about treading water in a base mm-hmm. level. Once you hit a certain level of proficiency at swimming. Treading water, unless it's like you're in a stormy sea thrown overboard or something, is completely unfailable, essentially. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're an, a proficient swimmer, that's just it's not a thing you're going to roll a 1 and fail at, or you know, even in a D100 system, a, a 1 or a 2, anything like that. So we took more of the dice pool approach, which is a binomial, for the nerds out there like me, it's a binomial calculation, and that is to prevent those really nonsensical moments where you fail at something that you were really, really good at. I'm not saying it's impossible. You could, obviously you could throw five dice and get all of them as failures. So I'm not, you know, but the odds of that versus one dice having a five percent using D 20, for example, having a 5% chance of complete and utter failure every single time you attempt something that's worth a skill check, uh, just didn't sit well with us. Mm -hmm. I'll let Kale kind of go from there. Yeah, so, I mean, our system there is basically meant to reflect reality um, more accurately as uh, we have, obviously, we still have dice that you could roll if you were a proficient swimmer to continue on the previous example there. And you could fail at it, but our chances, uh, like, mathematically are probably if you were a seven or, uh, let me, I don't want to use the exact number of dice because people aren't going to know what I mean yet, but... Uh, if you had a lot of dice to throw at it, our chances would be like one in a million or something ridiculous to fail if you were incredibly skilled. And then we also left the dice open-ended. So if you're doing something that is beyond your skill level, it's not impossible, but it's very improbable. Uh, all right. I can, And that's something I can definitely see. Now, given the... Now, um, given that, I'm curious what the or what the origins were when it came to when it came to this being just a gr- just a group affair that you that was happening around the table into let's try and make this into an actual game. So, I will speak real quick. Kale, for lack of a better term, found that some of the combat in the older systems were was boring uh, i've always equated it to a stick of butter and everybody's got a butter knife uh and they just and it's like no matter what you do if the creature has enough hit points it is not going down anytime soon right like it doesn't matter if you even critical if it's double or triple damage if the thing has a hundred just to give you an example 100 hit points and your weapon only does you know a d12 plus two you know that there's no way that you're going to then 
uh, kill that creature with one swing. And so a lot of the epic moments that you get in books or in movies or, you know, just even realistically, you know, there, there's just not a chance to one shot the creature. And I know that a lot of people don't like the one shot, but we've built in things to avoid that on the back end being a player. Um, but we, you know, we like that idea of like, you know, bar, you know, to quote Lord of the Rings, you know, when Bard shoots at Smaug, he doesn't shoot 14 arrows at them to kill him. You know what I mean? That moment is, is kind of like this epic thing that happens mm -hmm. and you just can't simulate that in a lot of the systems. So we wrote the system to have, epic moments be possible and yeah i, I oh sorry actually actually i spoke i spoke too soon go ahead go ahead oh i i actually i mean that about covered it that we really wanted to add that sense of like suspense or uh epicness and add to the tension and drama with combat and influence and every skill that you can do in the game, we wanted it to aid in the storytelling rather than hinder it or become all about the mechanics and not about the core of the game, which we believe is also part of the narrative. All right. Now, when it comes to... Given given that... Now, before before I get into this next question, I'd like, I'd like to ask if, any of you, or if either of you are familiar with the concept of GNS theory. Not in not in the that term maybe not not off the top of my head yeah um, the intent the in, it was some it was something that was put forward by Ron, by Ron Edwards um, in the early two thousands the idea being to, a, as a means to show um, the way, the ways that a game can be fun um, some games are what he referred to as simulationists some games are referred some games are narrativists and some games are what he referred to as gamist. Um, simulationist, well, that's kind of self-explanatory. It's trying to simulate a certain a certain activity or, or the like. Um, gamists are the ones that, are tr that emphasize the game part more than anything else. And narrativists are uh, emphasizing the story part. I'm vastly simplifying the concept, but given that, would you say that what you are going for leans more in the narrativist end of things, or... Would you say that you lean more in the simulationist when it comes to the degree of crunch that Rune and Steel will have? So, when we started the game four, six years ago, and I don't know how many versions ago, right? Uh, we'll say f five versions ago. Mm -hmm. I would have said it was a simulationist game. As we played the game and tested it with friends and family and such, we realized that we didn't want to... I don't know if you're... In, it, it, this may be a reference uh, that only some uh, shooter gamers get. We realized that we had created Arma. And if you've ever played Arma, you'll know that uh, it's very yeah. simulationist. And it's very, very slow paced, right? It can be. Oh, I've, I've played so, my fair share of Arma. Okay, uh, and I like not Arma, with... but there's... <laughs> I Daisy it's... Arma. It felt very Daisy Arma, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the, it was too slow. And we... We went back to the drawing board each time, and we kept saying, "Okay, well, we want more." Uh, to, to use your GNS theory, we wanted more narrative in it. We wanted more, you know, uh, less less simulation. And I'm going to use this as an example. I'm going to go back to the Arma. We wanted less Arma and more Battlefield, where it felt better, even if we lost some realism. Um, mm -hmm. And we had to make that sacrifice because at the end of the day, it is a tabletop and not a computer game. Our first version would have made a beautiful computer game, uh, not so good at the table. By the time that you know people are going to see this system, uh, it is a much slimmed down version. And anything that we felt was bulky, we put in a gray box and called it an advanced rule, or we put a big warning to the GM that we don't recommend using you know whatever rule it was until you were familiar with the system. Meaning, we wanted it to be a light system. It, 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 I don't want to overspeak how light it is, but we wanted the system to be very playable out of the box. And then as you got comfortable, you could put more and more, quote, simulation uh, pieces to it. Layers. Yeah, so I think a, a good summarization of this would be, uh, to quote Thanos, we tried to make it balanced as all things should be. And now, give, given that you get, so you guys are aiming for 
a narrative a narrativist leaning approach but at the same at the same time uh, you you're also aiming for a detailed combat system i'm curious how you're since you mentioned balance i'm curious how you're balancing those two those two particular types of goals okay so to give you, uh, let's use the the new the latest fantasy flight game star wars as narr- would you say that's a very narrative system yes no- in fact, okay. it, in fact, it was before before the before it was codified as Genesis with a Y. It was okay, referred to as go. narrative dice system. Okay, so it is too in our in our when we've played it and and I, we have played it some. I wouldn't say we're like masters of that system, but we fully understand and have sat down and played it, and I have GM'd it. Uh, it was too narrative for my taste, and not there was not enough crunch at all. Um, at certain points, but I liked the theme that the story was King, right? So that's, but you can have a story King and not completely remove some of the abilities to have what I'm going to put in quotes, realism, uh, and, and action. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have rules, like I said, that we, you build on it layers. It says, okay, well, if you want to play really narrative, it is very possible to do in our system. But as you go, or as a player, as a GM sees that these are optional rules that it can add more quote, I'm going to put crunch in there. Those are those are there, and so that was the very difficult balancing act, which is one of the reasons it took so long to develop. Mm-hmm. Now, admittedly, a lot of the times when I hear when I hear, and I'm and I'm not um I'm not slag I'm not slagging anybody in particular when I say this. This is just a case of um of experience when i hear um detailed combat system I'm u- what usually ends up conjuring in my mind is things like vi- um a lengthy amount lengthy amount of maneuvers that are des- that are designed to try and emulate different types of we- of um martial strikes um an emphasis on hit location a emphasis on wounds instead of instead of standardized hit points, and, and so on. Are some are some of those things going to be familiar in this system, or or a good chunk of them not going to be so? Yeah, so I think a lot of those uh, we would have those mechanics, but you would have them in an almost a simplified version until you decided you wanted to add more onto it, because we focused a lot on flow of the game, and we figured out, especially if for a new GM. Flow is, um, simplicity really helps flow at first. Now, there's always going to be some of those mechanics present, and you'll have to get used to a little bit of it, but there's not a whole lot of front-end crunch. It's when you start to get really into the system, and if you want to get into the weeds, we give you that option. Mm-hmm. And what- So, to try to go further into, mm-hmm. to, on that explanation, we have a locational, right? We have a location where you, you can actually hit location you can choose to hit at certain locations and Mm -hmm. have a certain amount of accuracy and and some of that depends on the character you're playing and such as that uh but at the end of the day i'll give you an example from role master that we did away with so you'd have these giant charts of criticals right and and some of them were fun and you know all this stuff but at the end of the day we simplified all and and at the end of the day what you want to know is is my character conscious you know what's the level of wound and it's kind of like you know if you're in a real fight you're kind of a surveying after the, let's say you win the fight you're surveying your wounds after the fight you're not sitting down staring at your wounds and so you only know or only care about the wounds as they occur uh, really as as kind of an after the fact when the you know somebody's going around trying to do medic skills on people and then you can get a little you know then you're out quote out of combat so you can get a little more crunchy there about what the severity of the wound was um for how long it's going to take to heal and things like that but in the combat we did a we simplified things down because it's like well are you conscious or not um you know are you at some kind of penalty or not and went from there all all right now you meant you mentioned having you mentioned having a sim, having a simpler version of the rules and then more advanced ones. The when it comes to the more advanced versions of different rules, is that is that going to be sectioned away in like the G, in like the GM section of of the book, or are some of those advanced rules going to be sp- spread throughout the book? 
Uh, a little of both, I would say. So, for example, our combat chapter, I believe we give you the simplified rules up front, and then afterwards we have a little blurb about some extra additional rules. And then we have a long-term critical chart for uh, players who, because originally, as he was saying, we play with a penalty system, and the penalty system doesn't get very specific. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, you could go down and look at the long-term. But if you never wanted to use that chart, you wouldn't have to. It's just an optional advanced rule. So, and we obviously have stuff in the GM tips. Uh. And another one that would be advanced would be since Kale was in HEMA, uh, he is a free scholar in HEMA. We, we mm -hmm. do have the strikes you're talking about, the ones that you would envision this kind of game having, mm -hmm. as far as like, you know, your Zorn How and things like that. But those are not required to play. You don't have to ever call a strike. This is for when a GM has. You know, he might have a certain group in the game that had knows certain strikes, right? They could limit the availability by internal game, you know, like as far as the game world. Uh, or just not play with them at all until they're comfortable and then add them in later or only use them in, you know, one-on-one -on -one fights as opposed to maybe a mass combat. Maybe you don't mess with that, you know, to keep the flow going. Mm -hmm. Now... With that in mind, I'd like to talk about magic for a bit. Now, obviously, give, given the subject matter that you guys are that you guys are working with, you're not going to be dealing with the sort of magic that you would see in a more high, in a more high approach. Um, I'm curious how how you now you guys are ta you guys mentioned in the Kickstarter that magic is weighty with potent effects but woefully woeful consequences is magic a case of high risk high reward and beyond that how would magic end up working out with this system so yeah, yeah um i i think i had a large hand in how our magic functions because my dad is originally a d20 based player or a role master player and I think the problem with those games at their core is that magic is always more powerful than melee at a certain level or point in the game. Oh yeah. And I was coming to the conclusion. I was like, well, we need to we need to make this even at least a little bit somehow. Like we need some mechanics to make this more like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings style, like magic where it's subtler. Um, it's powerful when it needs to be, but it's not always in your face fireball explosions like you're a walking mana battery. Mm -hmm. So to kind of to uh, emphasize on this, part of the part of the reason we constructed our own system from the ground up was simply because if somebody picked this game up, let's say they're a historian and they just liked role playing games, but they wanted to be able to run a simulationist model of Charlemagne against the Saxons and actually reenact some kind of uh, historical fight using our system, you can do that. And it's built for it, meaning it's built to play without magic at all, including reading runes. We have the ways that you would actually read runes for, like, you know, narrative reasons and maybe a placebo effect where somebody thinks that they're under the sign of a particular rune. So they get some kind of, uh, we'll call it a buff. You know, I think a lot of people know that term from mm -hmm. games. You receive some kind of benefit or buff, as you, may, as you will, but that's about all you're going to get out of the magic that the, I'm saying, if you want to go non mat like complete historical from there, we then it, it's kind of sweet spot in our opinion is what Kale said is somewhere in that uh, low to mid level magic system. And we do have aspects of fire and things. Uh, we try to limit those down to like high end fantasy creatures and things. Not to say a player couldn't pick those up, but that really is a GM call. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we we do not at the beginning of it, I wouldn't say advocate that. It's not that you can't. The rules are there, the spells are there. Uh, but we focus on the Vit key, which are rune masters, and we focus on the Say Theater, which are the sorcerers and rune you know, basically aspects and runes um, mm -hmm. are the basis of the magic and it's kind of what I would call the sweet spot. And Kale, you can yeah, and to, to add on to our like our philosophy for developing this magic system was it's always easier to add fantasy than to take it away right because when you start taking it away you start having to make it more like a simulation which adds rules and complication 
But to make more fantasy, it would be very easy to remove our weird rating, remove uh, like uh, spell failure, other things that the magic system wouldn't normally have. You know, if you wanted if you wanted to play walking battery style, it would be very easy to remove those rules and just ignore them and play with. Would we have uh, spells that do scale to higher fantasy, but they're just not readily accessed. Um, it's not the sweet spot of the game, as my dad was saying. They're mm-hmm. low fantasy, mid fantasy is what the game is more designed around, but it can easily handle uh, both sets. All right. Now, you mentioned now. Um, given the fact that you mentioned you mentioned that one of the two one of the two magical pillars is going is going to be runes. Um, I'm curious how how they're going to work because. Whenever it comes to the subject of runes, everybody has their own little interpretations on how rune magic should work. Oh boy, do they. <laughs> so give the little so we have three the three S. We're using the Elder Futhark. Mm-hmm. So So we have twenty four runes, but each rune does has more powers to it than just one, right? So each rune can perform multiple tasks. And our Vit key, which are the Rune Masters, the their magic is faster, uh, usually instant, or but I would say has less effect on the world overall. Uh, it's either used for fortune telling, it's used for quick uh, defense things. You know, th- there's a lot to do, or, or just even uh, mental influence things like that. Um, you, you throw a rune down, right? And so. That's how the Rune Master was designed, was to be... Uh, it, I don't know. Kale, you want to you wanna help me out with that? Yeah, so um, our Rune Master, I would say, uses a lot more covert magic. And uh, again, to quote some popular things, our like, fantasy worlds, the Witcher was mm-hmm. probably... It would be mirrored a lot in our Rune Magic. But when you start getting to the aspect magic, we start off lower level and having like what you would call... Uh, more like low fantasy spells and they upgrade up to all the way to very high fantasy spells but those are again limited access they're only castable by very powerful sorcerers or you'd have to um, go to great lengths to get your character to that power level mm-hmm. and when they're there um, the spell still has pro- potentially very powerful negative repercussions so you have to be careful about using magic like that Correct. So when you step into the game and you start casting magic, the first thing that happens is you start building corruption. And as you build corruption... Which we call weird rating. We -hmm. called weird rating, weirding the world. Um, As that builds up, you start having to make... uh, People are going to be used to this term. We use use the term saves. We didn't want to throw everything as a curveball. So you're going to have to make a a will save, for instance, uh, to, to resist such a thing. And then there comes a point where you just can't resist it anymore. If you just keep going and you don't cleanse it. So we use a lot of the Norse theories of sacrifice Mm -hmm. and it takes various forms, rest. I mean, there's a lot of ways to cleanse it, but it's, it's not easy. And then as Kale said, there's always a danger in casting spells. So unless a GM says, Hey, I'm not going to use spell failure and they could do that. They could just say, if it fails, it fizzles. Right. And, And you just, or it does a very minimal effect, and there's some very easy rules if they don't want to run with that. But if, as we wrote the game and how we intended it to be played, and, and I always put that in quotes, right? Because everybody that sits down and buys the game and plays it is going to have a different idea. Uh, we ex- intend for there to be a level of the, the high risk, high reward. And especially as you're casting those more powerful spells, the chance of failure is higher than you would think. It's not like, oh, I only on a one. And so you're either going to have to do some kind of ritual magic or you're going to have to do some, you know, there's going to have to be some level of preparation to cast some of the more like over the top magic that you see in other systems. Mm-hmm. And even then it has some repercussions to it. All right. Now, when it comes now, um, when speaking of those, speaking of those repercussions, um, and given, given the way you described, um, weird, weird, is it is it going when it comes to repercussions? Is it going to be one of those things where it where it can happen due to a bad ca- due to a bad casting role, or is it not as volatile? Well, because our system is going to use uh, that 
dice pool kind of mentality, right? Where mm-hmm. things are unlikely to fail if you're good at them. If you're attempting something of your skill level, your odds of success should be at the bare minimum 50-50. And really, I would say as a you know, as a metagamer, that's actually slightly outside of my skill level because I would always want to have higher percent chance than that. Mm-hmm. So I would go ahead and say, if you're casting something that's beyond that level, then your uh, chances of failure go up, obviously. And so when you take more powerful spells, they have more likely to give you higher repercussions. Mm-hmm. And because we use exceed by, or sorry, fail by and exceed by, how badly you fail a spell also matters. So you could fail a little bit or you could fail a lot, depending on what you're doing. All right. And, and I would say 50-50 is a very high number. That would be that you're actually at the point you're casting spells that are above your skill level. I mean, it's not that vol- I mean, It's volatile, but it's not that volatile on the on the initial cast. And I would I would say that that I would say that that's a high number, but um, I I am a vet I am a veteran of playing way too many XCOM games. So I so I um <laughs> yeah. yeah I trust I trust percentages as far as I can throw them. And anybody who's had to play any XCOM game in the last 20 years, and especially any game with the Long right. War mod, knows exactly my pain. You can do 18 per- 18% chance of failure, or, or, or you look at it the other way, 82% chance this headshot works and then you, you miss. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I've played some XCOM games. I mean, nothing's guaranteed, but we do have some other narrative ways uh, called fate dice that mm-hmm. are basically auto successes, and, and it's completely tied to role playing. Yeah, uh, but role playing your character well, and what I mean by well is their flaws and their good traits, right? So mm-hmm. we—that's where a lot of our narratives, narr- i can't say the word now—narrativism comes in. Is that we want people to succeed. Uh, We have exploding dice. So, you know, if you get a 12, if you're using our max dice type, which is D12, and you roll a 12, you get another chance to another, you know, to roll again for another success. And that's not even counting the fade dice. So, Mm -hmm. again, the numbers look bad on the, I say bad, the numbers look difficult on the surface. You know, if you have five dice, you need three successes. That is around 50 50. But when you have figure in the other pieces, we have found through play tests that that the chance of failure is pretty low. All right. At about that point. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. I didn't mean to misquote there and say 50, 50 was a high chance that I was trying to say that was on the lower end of probability of succeeding. I, I gotcha. Now, when it comes to crafting this, I found interesting because a lot of times games tend Games, even ones that even the ones that purport otherwise, tend to treat crafting as a glorified skill role. And in your case, you guys are advertising a risk versus reward setup at three tiers. I'd like you to explain to me what the what this um tier system is going to entail. Yeah, so I don't, wouldn't say that uh, it's not a glorified skill role. I think that's uh, somewhat fair on a surface level. When you kind of dive into it, though, it's the risk to reward is... Uh, I, I believe there's an MMO that I used to play called Vanguard. I, I think I'm getting that right. It's been a while. And they had a very cool system that I liked when you put something in like a smelter mm-hmm. and your character's skill level went into effect and you could either get a lump of iron out of it or end up with a higher tier based on how well you as the character were doing. And we took a little bit of that. Yeah. And we did took a little bit of that philosophy into, well, if you want to attempt something, which again, we use our dice pool. So if you're trying to attempt something that's at your skill level, you should end up with something good or, or what you expected or greater. And if you're attempting something above your skill level, then you have that high risk, high reward kind of uh, at play. Mm -hmm. So, you split your so to get into the crunch for a moment. If you have eight dice, right? You're an eight dice crafter, and to forge an iron weapon, and I'm not looking at it at the top, but let's just say it takes two successes. You can decide how much of your eight dice go toward forging, and how much of it goes into the three tiers. Meaning, and those are where you get the bonuses: lighter weaponry, you know, more durable things. You know, there's a lots of different bonuses, and we have. So one of the things we did is we said, okay. If we're going to play something, 
that could be mundane. And what I mean by mundane is non-magical. If you want to play a historical sim, how do you make what you would call mundane skills, non-magical skills, fun? So the first step was we said, well, every single skill in the game is going to have specializations to it and ones that are actually somewhat enjoyable to use. Okay, So mm -hmm. that was step one. Step two, when you get to crafting, we said, okay, well, these need to do things that are interesting. So if you wanted to make a sculptor, and let's just say you wanted to make a Michelangelo-level sculptor, when you start to gamble, the tiers do start doing some pretty cool things. You could do things like rally or morale. So you build the Sistine Chapel. I'm just giving you an example. Or you know something, a, a giant sculpture outside of a church or outside of your long haul, the sculpture of the famous lord who founded this city or town or you know viking village and based on the tier it starts giving all those that defend this area morale bonuses or you know things like that to and so your character you can actually choose fame and based on the sculpture on a one to three the fame kind of spreads from local village to you know a larger city to regional or even a kingdom at a tier three level uh, and, and so those are some of the things that we focused on was how do you make these interesting? And then it's like, well, I only need four dice based on how the way our system works because say to make a two dice success to craft this item. Now I have an extra, say, giving the example I gave you of eight dice. You now have four dice that you can now say, okay, I can make a tier one or a tier two. I can really gamble and try to make a tier three. But then if I fail, I've got a flaw in my, I've got a crack in the sculpture or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's where some of the fun comes in is as your character gets better and better at whatever craft they're doing. And this would be, like I said, sculpting, painting, anything. It could be anything, blacksmithing, weaponsmithing, things like that. You, uh, your characters, as they develop, they get, can take more and more risks to create greater and greater uh, works in the crafting yeah and to uh add on to that a little bit we again we just wanted to make sure that all of our effects uh as he was saying are plausible so it's not like you get an extra magic item or something or an extra ability based on the sculpture it just it boosts morale which we figured is a, po a plausible positive effect of having the sculpture of david or something like that that you're a near or around or something like that all right and Taking that with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes to the crafting setup, do you do you have plans to to set in to set in aside in equipment or what or even in the crafting rules themselves on people who want to make custom weapons and armor? Yes, I guess that's a quick answer, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, the answer is yes. If somebody wants to customize their gear, uh, in our pre. Our starter adventurer, uh, Kel and I created a. He is a crafter. Uh, he is a actual blacks. Is he a weapon or an armorsmith, Kel? Do you remember off the top of your head? I think weapon, but I could be wrong on that. Okay, I think he's a weapon smith, and we found that by just using the rules in play, they were able to create themselves a weapon, uh, quite good one, at, you know, as a level one adventurer uh, going out with this, as a blacksmith, and so even though they might have not you know they had to sacrifice skill dice into crafting uh we think the result ended up being somewhat beneficial to them to be a crafter mm -hmm. which a lot of games it's glossed over a lot of tabletop games crafting is either glossed over completely or like you said it's just a glorified skill roll and i'm not saying you don't roll dice for this but there are pieces to it like yeah. you want certain materials and so the gm can then have entire you know little side bars of you're going to go gather this or you send somebody out to gather this and then you come back and then you make these rolls and then there's this gambling aspect of how much do you want to press your luck and ha risk a flaw in your blade or how much do you want to just play it safe and that will come down to the individual player yeah and their personality yeah and i do want to i do want to clarify when i said glorified skill roll what i what i meant is that it's just the same as a standard skill. It ends up being the same as a standard skill check. So it's either a pat, it's either a pass fail with not a whole lot of variance in between. In a lot of cases, 
Uh, then, yeah, I think our game, we tried to eliminate having a whole lot of roles that are just pass-fail without a lot of uh, nuance to it because we, we found that that's very bad for narrative purposes, mm-hmm. especially if the GM or a player is trying to weave something in that might not necessarily be written in the base rules. Yeah. Yeah, so everything in our game, including crafting, is uh, there's a EB, which is exceed by, or an FB, or fail by, and it's 0 to 1, 2 to 3, and four plus and so that's the real base easy crunch you know you you, you could memorize that you I, I bet you if you sat down from what i just told you you would remember that the next time that mm-hmm. zero to one two to three and four plus is either real good you know four plus is on a fail by is obviously really bad and four plus on the succeed by is really good two's the middle ground and one's just barely yeah. and so that is the basis for the game mm-hmm. combat goes into six plus uh but you know, that's just adding a level of, you know, that's, those are insta-death strikes and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. That was an added layer of safety for the GM for when somebody actually does roll to uh, behead the dragon in one swing. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to influence, I've seen, I've seen some games um, mess, around, mess around with influence and it's usually a case of, whether or not a give, whether or not a given faction likes you, um, but would it be fair of me to say that the influence system that you guys are using is something that leans a little bit more into social combat? Yes. Um, the game. So we tried several crunchier versions, and then we realized that. At some point, it got in. so. There are some games out there that really the social combat they took to a whole new level, right? And, and it's probably much greater. But what we found when playing those systems was sometimes that got in the way of the actual players at the table having a back and forth. Like it would almost the rules themselves would almost get in the way. And so through our play test, we cut some of those back and. There is a, definitely a social combat aspect, but at the end of it, you only do that, A, in an important moment, and a GM or a player has to ask for it. Like, as you're going in, you can have one of these social combats where one player does a lore check to give the person more background before talking to the lord or things like that. Mm-hmm. And every player can kind of participate, and then you kind of get a big pool of dice at that point, and, you know, some kind of narrative zero you know then again we have the we have a social fail by and exceeds by just like on the other one and we then have an initiative system based on the leader of the party and this is very what we think is pretty unique and our social class in the game how you start off in your social class and your influence skill determine who the party leader is at the table and what does that mean well it means in party disputes, they're the final vote and they're the final deciding vote. So they're kind of the lead of the council, so to speak. It doesn't mean they're going to boss people around. It's not It's not meant to make people miserable. And obviously, a GM has to police that. But it does mean if there's a final dispute and in the, you know there's five people at the table and there's two wanting to give the sword to you know such and such treasure to somebody and two wants to give it to the other person, they're the final vote. And that gives people at the table the next time and it's kind of an anti-munchkinism, if you will, that maybe that person sitting beside him goes, you know, I really kind of wanted to have the final vote. And now instead of putting ranks into combat, uh, say they were close enough that they think they could overtake them at the next session, they could put points into influence. Or there are ways in the game to actually climb your social class, uh, spending essentially the next social class, and I don't want to get in the weeds too much. You can get the next social class by buying it. And that is basically as assumed that you're having lavish parties, kind of off time. It's not necessarily in the game, although I guess the, a GM could make a quest around it. But you could basically buy it with the next year's wages worth of the next social class to keep moving up. So we don't want people to feel like, oh, I rolled poor or I chose you know, to be poor or whatever and I'm just stuck there. Because that wasn't the way the Norse were. There was They, they had a more fluid society than that, including mm-hmm. sagas talked about escape thralls and things, you know becoming very famous and powerful people. So what we don't have a caste system, but it says, okay, the first time you sit down at the table, you will know who your social party leader is. And that is kind of an interesting dynamic because they, they can just choose in the social combat, as you will, who speaks. 
uh, they get to choose, you know, kind of the social initiative. Uh, and, and so that's kind of an interesting thing that we did to settle at the table through characters and how they built them, who the leader is. Yeah. And I would just like to add on, we do have a rules, like very light version of that. So you don't always have to enter to a social combat. Like if you're just dealing with your local onion farmer or whatever, and your players are wanting to have a discussion with him, then we have a quick, you know, exceed by fail by chart, which goes zero to six and vice versa. So mm -hmm. again, you have to state Either the player has to want to engage, you know, the players at the table have to want to engage in a social combat, the big one, or the GM initiates it and the players will go, yeah, that's what we want to do. You know, if they don't want that level, you, like Hale said, you can basically do the old school role play, get some bonus dice to add to your dice pool, roll and see how it comes out with your influence versus the character's uh, disposition. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now, um, on the Kickstarter page, it's advertised that you get that you guys are doing a classless leveling system. Um, but a couple of times during this conversation, you've made reference to levels. Is a lot of times when classless systems are presented, it's a case of experience as currency, and you're buying advancements. Are you guys doing something like that, where it's that level of um, freeform, or? are you working within the nets of different archetypes? So the quick and dirty of this is we found that that those systems, this is just our opinion, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. got theirs. We found those systems were too crunchy. So we said, we're going to only have 10 levels in the game at the start. That doesn't mean we can't expand later, but right now that you go from level one to level 10 and that keeps power levels down as well. Right? So um, a character caps at 10th level and those are rewarded the levels are awarded based on successfully completing objectives. Mm -hmm. So the GM just says, okay, you're all now level two. That's literally how we set it up. It says you completed this mission, you're level two. And then we yeah, say that, go ahead, Kill. Uh, I was going to say, I believe uh, new at D&D, D&D 5E has a system that does our type of leveling, which is called milestone leveling or narrative leveling or something like that. It's mm -hmm. almost identical where the GM decides at the end of an adventure when to. So I just wanted to make it clear we're not exactly super unique in that regards, but we did start production seven years ago, so I don't believe 5e had had that mechanic yet. Mm. I could be wrong. No, it did no, it's um and that and that that particular style isn't as new as Wizards of the Coast would probably like me to no, like me not. to believe. Um but even with that, between le between levels, and given the fact that you adver that you make a remark that no two warriors will play the same, even though you're using levels, it's not like what you're getting through those levels is is going to be exactly cut and dry. Correct. So you get a certain amount of skill points per level, which that part's cut and dry. However, uh, there are ways to earn skill points in the game. Uh, other ways, but that for the most part, let's just use the level skill points. What we meant by that, I want you know to more clarify, is because you're then skinning your skill points however you want. Okay, so you're not creating a warrior. We don't have a warrior. We have titles, and what titles are are basically ways are, are basically a template that you would fall into that then gives you bonuses when you achieve it. And the simple one we always use because it is a Norse based game is Viking. Viking is actually a lesser title. Mm -hmm. It takes so many ranks in combat, so many ranks in sailing, so many ranks in different skills. And then you have achieved the title of Viking. And at that moment, anytime you're using a skill that relates to being a Viking, you get a plus one to one of your dice. So um, our dice are pass fail when you're rolling the pool. So it's not a lot of adding. It's not, it's a very simple, easy to eyeball and makes for good flow. But you're getting a plus one to one of the dice. And you're like, well, that's not very good. But, well, when you think about it in a system, you only need, say, three successes. If you need a six on all those, six or greater, and one of them is a five, you automatically, you basically succeed on an extra dice. And that can be a very, very big deal depending on the skill check. So what we did is we found that when we didn't have the templates, and, and that's the titles, mm -hmm. that players, especially new players, were lost. It was too many skills 
and they didn't know where to they didn't have a focus right they didn't know where to spin there because their people are so used to i'm a fighter i'm a rogue i'm a sorcerer whatever it is and okay when i level up i get to roll my dice to level up i then get so you know three skill points and i get one extra uh, feet or something you know whatever depending on the system mm-hmm. and it's just all set in stone so w- the we found the title and the template gave people direction and a goal to achieve by the you know second or third level depending on it it just depends on the on the title whether it's greater or lesser and how they spin their dice and nobody has to do it you can completely go off template and don't have a title at all all right it's just a way to look at it um as a as a direction for players and since you mentioned that dice are going on the success based the whole pass fail thing um I'm yet. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the die pool isn't going to get as crazy as, say, Shadowrun. Nope, that was four versions ago. <laughs> I don't feel. I don't feel like somebody bringing in three pounds of dice to the table every week has good flow. Yeah, I can tell you from experience and play tests, that's the case. I had a buddy Ryan Frazier that helped us play test it, and he broke the game for us, and and it was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, I'm just going to focus on one skill. And by the time he was third level at one point, and this is four, like I said, this is probably three versions ago. He had 17 dice. He was throwing at one, one attack with a bow. It yeah, was got insane. so bad that we actually ended up counting how long it takes to uh, count up dice. So we know it was about, was it two and a half second per dice or something like that? Or two and a half seconds for a pool of dice. I can't remember the exact now. I'd have to look, but we had a sheet doing the math to see how long it looked at dice when we were like, you know, instead of doing this math, maybe we should just reduce the number of dice. So we cap at 10. So there's your answer. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, that's a lot, but that's grandmaster. So you have to focus a character heavily in something to reach grandmaster so we have titles that go from apprentice to grandmaster so you know you have your you know you have a apprentice journeyman master grandmaster did i miss one kale uh, not not that i'm i can think of i have to look no at oh, I well right. if you don't have any ranks in something you get one dice so you can always try something with one dice mm-hmm. uh and you're a novice and that the second and the third dice you're an apprentice at four through seven you're or four through six you're journeyman seven through nine you're a master and the 10th rank is grandmaster so uh the way we then made the way we then made up for the fact you're not rolling more dice is there is now a vertical and a horizontal so your base skills and and there's some exceptions to this but your base skills on most characters will start with d8s and you have to increase those to 10s, and then you're max at 12. So the greatest dice you will roll is 10d12 on a particular proficiency. All right. Yeah, and just to add on to that just a little bit, he we also, so you only, even if you had two Grandmaster skills, which is unlikely, the character sheet, I believe, limits you to one specialization um in a grandmaster skill, so you can only be a Correct. grand, true grandmaster of one thing. Correct. Mm-hmm. So the specializations we kind of touched on it in the crafting, right? And I said every skill and every and, and more specifically every proficiency in the game has a specialization, uh, a set of specializations that go with them. And what we did was he said, okay, at journeyman. If you want to think of it as a small pyramid, we have a three, two, one pyramid. Three, you have three skills or three specializations at journeyman. You get two at master, and you get one grandmaster skill. And one of the reasons, and one of the ways that we, go to, I'm going to backtrack for a second because now that we've explained this, the grandmaster skill when you choose to be able to use magic, which takes one of your traits away at character creation. So there's this is one of the ways we tried to like not go in the direction other people did if you want to use magic in the world is this was one part of our balancing we said first off you have to use one of your two traits you start with and you have spark of magic so to use magic you have to be gifted with magic you're not going to just be able to willy-nilly pick it up okay Mm -hmm. second the moment you do that and you go down the magic path that chews up your grandmaster talent so even if you went 10 ranks in blade and had magic at your disposal, you could not become a grandmaster of the spear, or grandmaster of the sword, or whatever it is. You could only be that—that that is already used up, a sorcerer or a vitki. 
All right. That is part of our balancing. Now, taking now taking all that taking all that into account. Um, now, I've, there's a few questions I have as far as what as far as what the plans are in the short and long term. The first part that that I'm curious about is. Do you guys plan on putting any sort of PDF that would entail a kind of quick start or anything like that in the future? Uh, I would say that is definitely in discussions right now. I don't know mm -hmm. if we've made a final verdict on it, but I, I think we'd be leaning towards yes, but we'll we'll say maybe for now. All right. I would say I would say seventy five percent yes. All right. And what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Well, I've got the rule book sitting beside me. So we had four like test copies, and this counts some monsters. We've got monsters in the back, uh, Norse-based mm -hmm. mythological monster. We're sitting at 380 pages. 380 pages. And when this, when this is released, do you plan on releasing it um, ju just as physical or physical and digital? Right now, just physical. Uh, but I, you know, I ran into somebody the other day that cannot, they can't see well, right? Mm -hmm. And so they said, I need PDFs so that it can be read to me. And it's something that we had not, I, I, I had not, I don't, maybe Kale had, I had not considered, right? Like, well, oh, okay, to help people that can't see. Mm -hmm. So I, and this is something Kale I've not discussed with, <laughs> so you've got us on here and Kale's going, what? Uh, but it's something that, uh, we are leaning, I, I am leaning toward eventually once the game's been out for a while to get more coverage and things doing a PDF, but on initial launch, we are not going to do a PDF unless a situation like that. Somebody says special request, Hey, I need this in a PDF form. I'm already told mm -hmm. the guy I'll get it, get him a PDF. It's not that I'm not going to allow it. It's just that that's not our main version right now. And that's just really from, you know, we know, and I'm sure you know, that it's very easy right now. We could, you and I could go out right now and Google some game we want to play and find a PDF that somebody's hacked. And so mm -hmm. that's that's the reason. All right, I get, I can get that. Now, first off, I do. Now you guys are currently at eight point two thousand with a goal of ten thousand with thirty seven days to go. Now. For the sake of this, I need to make sure that I don't tempt the gods of irony, so give me one moment. Okay. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general window in, ter general window in terms of the calendar year. Obviously the, obviously the 2021 calendar year at the, at the earliest, or 2022 if need be. No, so... We're looking at the latest, I would hope, is mid-spring this year, this coming year, as far as getting it to people. Just in time for me to lament the lo the loss of my beloved cold weather. Correct. But that's, that's what we're looking at. I mean, because like I said, the book's sitting in front of me. There are very few changes that need to happen to this book. I mean, we have, after six years, this thing's been play-tested pretty extensively uh, mm -hmm. we're happy where the rules are right now if you if i had to ship this to you right now i'd feel pretty good about handing it to you uh, art is what we're going to be waiting on we're going to be waiting on distribution of dice i mean COVID has slowed down a lot of distribution centers and so we're kind of at the mercy of third parties our artist is awesome but i know he's very busy mm -hmm. and you know if we get this funding most of that <laughs> you know he's probably not if he hears this yeah well, it's true martin you know this uh most of the money that we're raising right now is to pay for the artist. Uh, for the so we, we have some wonderful theme art we're wanting to put in this book on the inside. Like you, the cover's nice, right? It's, it, mm -hmm. He does a great job. But you know, people like art. It, it helps sell the theme and the feel of the game, and uh, that's definitely part of the reason that uh, we're doing the Kickstarter. I mean, aside from, I mean, believe it or not, box wraps, cardboard, dice, runes, all that stuff is pricey. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. you know, so to get this out to people in the format we want them to be able to play it, you know, that's really what this this first ten thousand is is just uh, the base level of getting the game out there to people to play. All right, and with the, and I do wish you I 
I do wish you the best of the best of luck when it comes to getting that getting that set up and get and getting it out there. Um, and with that, with all of that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, it's been great. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you having us and yeah. uh, reaching out to us. That's it's. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. This this show is awesome, man. Mm -hmm. And anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And in your case, we have mead. Oh. Skull. Well. <laughs> I have a drinking horn sitting behind behind me. It's part of it. It's, it's in the tier, so I had to order myself one to make sure the quality was good. At least that's how I sold it to the wife. Yeah. I um I I don't have a I don't have a drinking horn yet, but I have a handful of steins. Oh, excellent. That'll work. Mm -hmm. And I I have to get I have to get the larger steins because I am not a short man. Well, then you need one of these drink I'm telling you you need one of these drinking horns. They're fantastic. They hold an entire beer with ease and uh they they're just I sat around uh, having a beer out of one of these, uh, sitting around a table, just sitting with some friends, and it just it had a feel to it. <laughs> there was a certain magic about drinking yeah. out of an ox horn. Yeah, and I, and and hey, hey, this time this time of year is the perfect excuse to dr to drink that instead of drinking the abomination that is eggnog. Uh, I I totally agree. So, uh, skull. Yeah. Your your channel's great, and mm -hmm. uh, you know we look forward to hearing uh, hearing this and uh, hearing some more people come in here. So, mm -hmm. and of thank you for having us. Yep, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.